Pearson will do that uh, one of these days, the other, the other day after uh, our uh, get-together on uh, that Saturday night. He was up here and uh, uh, he uh, sounded like a pro. Uh, he really does a fine job. Uh, I can assure you it's pretty intimidating to get up in front of a group of people like that and uh, he'll He'll do it one of these days. He really does a good job. Aren't you uh, thankful for God's uh, cleanup <coughs> plan, as it were? Not for automobiles, but for lives. And the price that he was willing to pay to do just that. Thank you, Larry. <coughs> Our text comes from the uh, 29th chapter of... Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, if you want to turn that, uh, uh, turn to that and keep that before you, uh, would you pray with me? Father, the message ever since Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of that tree, the message you have declared is that you were on a mission and that mission was and is to restore not automobiles but lives <coughs> not to just make over the old clunker, the old life, as it were, but to transform and make entirely new. That never is, it never could be accomplished by all of our efforts no matter how sincere. But the one way that that could ever be accomplished was through the offering of a perfect lamb that by bloodshed you could make new. I thank you that that has been your intention from the beginning. And not just to make new, but to make better than ever. Thank you for Jesus, in whom alone that is possible. Would you speak in a powerful way in these moments through your word, Father, and may it accomplish what you intend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some words in the scriptures uh, carry uh, extraordinary significance and importance. Some do so because of the concepts, uh, the realities that they express. For instance, salvation. That's a big word in Scripture because of what it conveys. Uh, forgive, a big word in Scripture. Deliver, an important word in Scripture because of the concepts that they portray. Other words uh, are important in Scripture just because of the sheer number of times that they're found. For instance, Israel is found in the scripture uh, close to 3,000 times. That's a pretty big word in scripture. Uh, cloud or clouds found uh, hundreds of times in scripture. Pretty big word. In our text, we encounter one of those especially important words. It's especially important uh, both in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. 
It's a word that's used nearly 300 times in the scriptures in our text itself. Our text is a chapter of 29 verses. Of those 29 verses, this word is used no less than nine times in those 29 verses. If, you, if you've been reading along in Deuteronomy uh, over these months, you might have already noted that that word is covenant. In Scripture, covenant is an extremely significant concept. We first encounter the word covenant uh, uh, when the Lord God speaks to Noah concerning the flood. In uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 18, God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. He was talking about the upcoming flood and his deliverance of Noah through that. After Noah and uh, his family exit the ark at the conclusion of that uh, year and a little more of uh, the earth being covered with water, uh, God uh, speaks these words. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 9. I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you, and what is the covenant? Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. God would later make a covenant with Abraham, then with David. He would make a covenant with Levi, and those are just a few of God's covenants. Covenant is always an arrangement between two parties. It may be an arrangement between two individuals, Jacob and his uh, uh, uncle, as well as father-in-law, Laban, uh, made a covenant that they would not harm each other as they parted. But in the Bible, most often, uh, covenant, most often covenant is spoken of uh, uh, between God and an individual. Uh, maybe it's between God and a group of individuals. Uh, some covenants are unilateral. That is, uh, God covenants to do something and there's no response required on the part of the other individual or group. The rainbow and his promise to never again destroy the earth with a flood. That's an example of a unilateral covenant. It's a covenant made between God and people, but it demands no response on the part of people. God just says, this is what I covenant, this is what I, 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 I promise you. But most often, when the Bible speaks of covenant, uh, both parties have responsibilities to fulfill as part of the covenant. Such is the case of the idea with covenant in our text. Forty years earlier, before the events of the text, God had made a covenant with this nation, this people, Israel. Around the base of Mount Horeb, uh, and also known as Mount Sinai, uh, they heard a voice booming. They saw the mountain ablaze with fire and smoke. And out of that, God spoke the Ten Commandments. And we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13, these words, He declared to you His covenant, the Ten Commandments, which He commanded you to follow. God gave the covenant, and the people's responsibility was to obey, to follow. God's part was that he had chosen Israel out of all the peoples on the face of the earth,
to be his treasured possession. And as such, he would bless them uniquely. But Israel's part was to be obedience, keeping the commandments of God. On the occasion of our text, God uh, enlarges, if you will, adds to that covenant that he made at Mount Horeb. Listen, if you will, to uh, the first verse of chapter 29 of Deuteronomy. These are the terms of the covenant the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites in Moab. In addition to the covenant he had made with them at Horeb. You see, uh, a, 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 an additional aspect or an addition or, or, or uh, an enlargement of that covenant is what we're talking about. I'd like to examine briefly some significant aspects of that covenant uh, made there in the land of Moab along the Jordan River, especially aspects regard, regarding the, the role or the part that people were to play in that, uh, uh, in that covenant. First of all, the covenant was to remind them of God's working in the past. Verse 2, Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, your eyes have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to all his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those miraculous signs and great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. During, <clears throat> during the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. You ate no bread and drank no wine or other fermented drink. I did this so that you might know that I am the Lord your God. When you reached this place, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out to fight against us, but we defeated them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. God said... Uh, as part of this covenant, you'll need to uh, look in the rearview mirror, as it were. Remember how I worked to bring you out of Egypt. Remember how I have cared for you these 40 years as you wandered in the wilderness. I've always provided water. I've always provided food. I've provided clothes that did not wear out, shoes that did not wear out. And not only that, when you've arrived near your destination, I have defeated mighty kings before you. If the people would be faithful to their uh, part in the covenant, they would need to remember God's uh, past faithfulness and his mighty working. If they uh, would uh, follow God's uh, uh, commandments and his covenant, his blessings, including prosperity, would result. Verse 9, carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. God uh, promised uh, uh, material, financial prosperity if they would obey. While the covenant uh, uh, was made with the nation as a whole, the nation in its entirety, Yet every single individual was required to uh, participate, uh, uh, to be involved. Notice verses 10 and 12. All of you are standing today in the presence of the Lord your God, your leaders and chief men, your elders and officials, and all the other men of Israel, together with your children and your wives and the aliens living in your camps who chop your wood and carry your water. You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath. You see, uh, uh, the covenant, while it was a national thing, it was also a very, very personal thing. It was to be with the leaders and the wives and the children and even the aliens it was to be a very personal thing. 
obedience uh, to the covenant requirements would necessarily begin not merely with outward obedience, but it would necessarily begin with a heart commitment. Verse 16, you yourselves know how we lived in Egypt and how we passed through the countries on the way here. You saw among them their detestable images and idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. God through Moses says, be careful. I'm not interested only in obedience. I'm interested in your heart. Is your heart wholly devoted to God? Or is your heart kind of fickle, uh, this idol this day, this idol that day? The danger of that is described as bitter poison. A heart less than totally committed to God is like drinking poison, it will destroy a person. And God warned this nation of that danger. But mere lip service, uh, hypocrisy, deceitfulness, would carry devastating consequences both for the individual and for those around. Verse 19, when such a person, that is, a person whose heart is not wholly devoted to God, hears the words of this oath, he invokes a blessing on himself and therefore thinks, I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way. This will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive him. His wrath and zeal will burn against that man. There's a real danger for these Israelites. If they would kind of just say, oh well, I'll just declare my allegiance and I'll just pretend my obedience, but really I'm going to do things my own way. God through Moses says, hey, that's not just going to affect you. It's going to affect all of those around you. Sin is like that. It's always been like that. It has a pervasive effect. But that person who would be hypocritical, the dry land, if you will, if that person con continued in his or her hypocrisy, it would kind of permeate those around the watered land, if you will, and it would have devastating consequences on the entire nation. In fact, if they would disagree, uh, disregard, turn away, ignore, abandon the commandments of God, they would invite His wrath and destruction. Verse 25. <clears throat> this, because this people has abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, the covenant He made with them when He brought them out of Egypt, they went off and worshipped other gods and bowed down to them, gods they did not know, gods he had not given them. Therefore the Lord's anger burned against this land, so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, the Lord uprooted them from their land and thrust them into another land as it is now. Don't miss words in that uh, section like, his anger burned, furious anger, great wrath. It was no small thing to have a heart that refused to submit to and follow the commandments of God. Clearly, uh, for the nation of Israel, God's offer of covenant was a serious business. It was not uh, a matter, not an issue that could be taken lightly or treated casually. His offer of grace and blessings uh, was great, but their response was of the utmost importance. 
As wonderful as those promised blessings would be uh, for obedience on the part of Israel, for embracing that covenant and obeying from their hearts, it was merely to be a prelude, a foretaste, as it were, of the blessings that God had in mind when He would offer another covenant, a future covenant. As Israel lived under and struggled and often failed to uh, uphold their role in the covenant over the next 900 years, after that 900 years, God revealed uh, His intentions to a prophet Jeremiah, and He spoke through that prophet Jeremiah of a covenant that uh, He had uh, planned from long before the uh, Mount Sinai covenant. And so Jeremiah spoke to a people besieged, to a people surrounded, by a powerful Babylonian army, a people soon to be defeated, a people soon to be carried captive to a distant land, Jeremiah relayed these hope-filled words from a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. Jeremiah chapter uh, 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Lord, I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And so it was from the day that Jeremiah uttered those words in 586 B.C. Over the next nearly 600 years, every pious and God-fearing Jew lived in the light, in the hope, in the expectancy of the promise of a new covenant. A new covenant focused not so much on a piece of real estate and material prosperity, but a new covenant uh, focused on something far more significant. A new covenant focused on wickedness forgiven, sins forgotten, knowing God in a personal, intimate way. That's why to a handful of men gathered upstairs in a room in the city of Jerusalem to uh, celebrate God's past deliverance, His deliverance of their people from the land of Egypt. They're gathered there to celebrate the Passover. It's been nearly 600 years since Jeremiah wrote those words about New Covenant. And then those men in that room hear Jesus speak words like this. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. <clears throat> Did you catch that? Jesus said that something he was about to do 
would usher in that new covenant. Can you imagine the excitement, the thrill that the words of Lord Jesus must have brought to every one of those men as devout Jews? New covenant. We've waited so long and now he says it's here. But as with any uh, previous covenant, so this new covenant would require a response from uh, those who would enter into covenant. Like Israel, there in the land of Moab on the eastern banks of the Jordan River in our text. <coughs> so for uh, these people in the day of Jesus, and indeed for every person since that time, entering into the covenant, this new covenant, would require some things. It would require remembering. Just like Israel was called when they entered into covenant. Remember what God has done. Remember how He's led you and provided for you. So Jesus declared twice on that night, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, remember what I'm about to do. To... Uh, enter into the covenant with God. This new covenant requires that a person would put his or her complete faith and trust in what God in Christ has done on the cross. It's not about how hard I work. It's not about being good enough. It's about what He did on the cross. Hence, His emphasis in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when you share this Lord's Supper moment, you remember the Lord's death until He comes. If a person would enter into this new covenant, it must be with his or her gaze firmly fixed on what God has already done in the cross and Christ and His shed blood. Covenant, this covenant literally stands or falls on what God did in the past on a cross outside of Jerusalem. This covenant, unlike the covenant in our text, uh, is not merely for a single nation, a single ethnic group, a single Jewish race. This covenant is for uh, every nation, tribe, people, and language. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This covenant is offered to all nations. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Thirdly, this covenant, like the text, remains, demands a response. A response from every individual who would enter in. It begins with a heart commitment, but it leads then, as Larry so aptly reminded us, it begins with a heart commitment, but that leads to obedience. Putting one's trust and faith in God through Jesus Christ, repenting of one's sin, confessing Christ as who He is, the only means to God, being baptized into His name. You can't enter into this covenant by some means of pretense. Oh, I'll just go to church. Oh, I believe that there is a God. No. It involves a personal commitment. It must be evidenced by obedient faith. And fourthly, to enter or not enter into this covenant relationship entails consequences, consequences far more significant than Israel would uh, incur on the banks of the Jordan River. On the banks of the Jordan River, uh, Israel was told that uh, if 
an individual did not enter into this covenant relationship, he or she would be cut off from the people of Israel. And that was a serious thing. But you couldn't keep on living. But the uh, outcome of entering or not entering this new covenant 